grandfather's uncle, or my, or my, my great grandfather's brother, was, uh, was Bill Kennedy. Um, he was born in 1883 in Harlem, New York City. Um, actually, I have, uh, I have a little slide of Harlem now. There we go. Um, and uh, then when he was, uh, those are his parents, uh, so my great, great grandparents. Um, and then when he was uh, by, so, uh, sometime like, between age seven and 12, he, he moved to uh, Porchester, New York, um, which is a town kind of, uh, it's like 12 miles north of the Bronx, I think. Um, and um, which was um, part of what got him into marathon running. Uh, is there, if anybody's familiar with the, uh, this kind of forgotten marathon that took place in 1896. Like we all know Boston, the Boston, you're probably, I'm sure you know, you know the Boston Marathon is, is the oldest, it's the oldest uh, continuously run marathon in the country. Uh, but there was one that took place six months before the first Boston Marathon that happened in New York and then it wasn't repeated. Um, they didn't hold it annually after that. So, uh, but it went through Porchester and um, Bill was 12 years old at that point and uh, he was so excited he kind of jumped in to the road when the, when the leaders came through, the, the guys uh, in, in the lead, and he and his friends, you know, pretty much every boy in town, as he said, uh, jumped into the main street and just ran, ran along with them and saw them off at the, at the railroad bridge. Um, and that was kind of a watershed moment in his life. I got him into the, um, you know, into racing. Uh, let's see, so, oh, as far as how the book came about, um, so again, so, so Bill's younger brother, uh, so I do have a picture of this, so he's in the middle there. Uh, that's my, in the middle is my great, Great. Uh, that, in the middle is my great grandfather, and next to him is uh, my great great grandfather. I was speaking here at the Hopkinton Historical Society about uh, the book I've co-authored uh, with, with my father, Lawrence W. Kennedy, "Bricklayer Bill: The Untold Story of the Working Man's Boston Marathon." Uh, and in short, it's about a relative of mine who survived typhoid fever, um, a fall off a five-story building, uh, some train and car accidents, and uh, went on to. Uh, to victory in, in the nation's premier marathon back in the early kind of scrappy decades of the sport. And uh, how long have you uh, researched this for? I, it took uh, five to six years, over, over, over five years um, working on it, um, you know, part time while working full time, uh, even, even in collaboration. So it was um, with, with my father, my co author, so about five, five, six years. And is there somewhere that uh, somebody could uh, purchase this book or find out more information? Yes, um, if you go to the UMass Press uh, website, it is, it's on Amazon as well, uh, but if you want to support your uh, local Massachusetts um, state uh, education system, uh, it, it's for sale on uh, the UMass Press website. All right, thank you very much. Sure thing. Um, we're going to try to you know, make this sort of interactive, so if anybody has any questions at any point, you know, don't wait for, of course at the end I'll open it up to Q&A, but you know, if you have a kind of a burning question, feel free to just you know, fire away with a question. Um, and I'm excited, and, and first, first can I ask, uh, how many people here are from Hawkington? And then how many from Ashland? That's great, all right, thanks for, I mean I appreciate everybody coming out, and I was excited to hear that uh, when Ian told me that you know we're going to have the Ashland contingent, that's it's great. Uh, I was almost worried: is there going to be a, a brawl, you know, <laughs> between the historical societies, you know? And because they're historical societies, I was picturing like cutlasses and blunderbusses, but um, that's the way my wacky mind works. But uh, so, so first, like, just to introduce myself, um, as far as my connection to the subject of the of the book. Um, again, I'm uh, the so my grandfather's uncle, or my or my, my great grandfather's brother. Was, uh, was Bill Kennedy. Um, he was born in 1883 in Harlem, New York City. Um, actually, I have, uh, I have a little slide of Harlem now. There we go. Um, and uh, then when he was, uh, those are his parents, uh, so my great, great grandparents. Um, and then when he was uh, by, so, uh, sometime like, between age seven and 12, he, he moved to uh, Porchester, New York, um, which is a town kind of, uh, it's like 12 miles north of the Bronx, I think. Um, and um, which was um, part of what got him into marathon running. Uh, is there, if anybody's familiar with the, uh, this kind of forgotten marathon that took place in 1896. Like we all know Boston, the Boston you're probably, I'm sure you know, you know the Boston Marathon is, is the oldest. It's the oldest uh, continuously run marathon in the country. Uh, but there was one that took place six months before the first Boston Marathon that happened in New York and then it wasn't repeated. Um, they didn't hold it annually after that. So, uh, but it went through Porchester, and um, Bill was 12 years old at that point, and uh, he was so excited, he kind of jumped in to the road when the, when the leaders came through, the, the guys uh, in the lead, and he and his friends, you know, pretty much every boy in town, as he said, uh, jumped into the 
Main Street and just ran, ran along with them and saw them off at the, at the railroad bridge. Um, and that was kind of a watershed moment in his life. I got him into the, um, you know, into racing. Uh, let's see, so, oh, as far as how the book came about, um, so again, so, so Bill's younger brother, uh, so I do have a picture of this, so he's in the middle there. Uh, that's my, in the middle is my great, great, uh, that, in the middle is my great grandfather, and next to him is uh, my great, great grandfather. Um, and it was uh, a cousin, so ba basically, just to make a long story short, um, a, um, a cousin of mine, kind of an elderly cousin, she was um, my grandfather's first cousin, um, worked at Harvard Press um, back in the 1960s when Bill was an old man, and he was living in St. Louis at, that, at this point. He, he kind of bounced around the country, um, but for, he lived for a long time in St. Louis, and it, it's at that point that he um, kind of collected all these scraps of, and articles that he'd been collecting over the years, kind of gathered them and wrote um, sort of, uh, it wasn't, Intended as a memoir, it was intended as um, just a book about marathon running. Which really, this is you know, the, uh, he started this in the early 1960s, and it was kind of before the big running boom of the 70s. Um, so he, he couldn't find a publisher for it. Uh, and long story short, it sat in my cousin Anne Louise's uh, house in Watertown, in her basement for 45 years until she mentioned it to me and my dad. Um, so I'm a, I'm a trained uh, journalist. Uh, I went to school for journalism and you know, basically a full-time um, writer and editor. And uh, my father's a um, historian. Uh, so we kind of joined forces and, and took this uh, manuscript that our Uncle Bill had written uh, as a starting point and then researched it, went to, you know, spent a lot of time down at the BPL, um, the Boston Public Library, microfilm archives, uh, and, you know, it's, anyone want to take, take a guess? Anyone want to take a guess? How many new, daily newspapers do you think there were back then, back in, say, 1917, when, uh, which is nine? There were nine daily newspapers, yeah. In, in Boston, yeah, 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 yeah. So there was a lot of material. Uh, um, now, and I should say, some of them were like 16 pages long. They, were, they weren't all um, as big, as deep as the, as the globe is now. But uh, but there was a lot of material. You know, some great sports pages, uh, some great sports coverage, um, and there was a great article about Hopkinton, which I'm going to get to uh, later. Um, so you know, so basically, my dad and I did all this research, pieced together Bill's life, uh, and found. Um, I have a couple excerpts I'll, I'll read, uh, but it just, uh, just I'll also just tell you a few of the highlights. Um, the craziest stories was how Bill, as a bricklayer, so I should back up a second. So when he was about 17 or 18, he, uh, he and his older brother, his, his younger brother, Joe, um, hopped a freight train and rode west uh, when they were like 17, 16 years old. And uh, basically for, for years after that, Bill kind of kicked around the country. He had already, he'd become a, an apprentice bricklayer when he was 13. Uh, so now he's 17, 18, and he's a, you know, uh, he's a, I guess a journeyman bricklayer, and uh, he would just follow jobs around the country. Um, and then he was in, like I said, he was in St. Louis. He did two different stints in St. Louis. And in 1904, I think I have a picture of that. Oh, okay, this is just sort of a, kind of a fun cartoon uh, that illustrates um, back in the day, uh, this is, essentially people thought if you ran you know, 26 miles, 385 yards, you were risking life and limb because look at poor Pheidippides, you know, right? Uh, drop dead, you know? um, As we now know, you know, you can, you can train and you can, you can do it. You know, it doesn't have to be um, as a first Boston race. Uh, so Bill was in St. Louis when the 1904 World's Fair happened. Just put the little inset there. If anyone's seen that movie, that's, uh, that song, Meet Me in St. Louis, Louis, was, was, was big. Basically, he was, um, uh, he was at a baseball game uh, and heard a band play it. Kind of, this is even before there were organs. They would have brass, a brass band would play in between innings, and, uh, and that song was popular, and he's, he was 20, 21 years old, and he heard the song and said, that's the next place I'm going to go, St. Louis. You know? So he went to St. Louis. He, he caught the World's Fair, and there was a marathon at the World's Fair. Um, do I have a picture of that? Yeah. So, and there was, there was, it was kind of, th that's a whole other story, uh, but there was doping involved. There was che you know, che cheating and uh, um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Um, whoops, I'll get back up. But the, it sort of captured his imagination. And like I said, he'd been in the first, he had jumped into the first marathon uh, for like a mile when he was a kid. And then, then he caught this, um, this kind of wa another watershed event. Um, and that was, w w that was that's when he started um, running. Uh, it, also should mention, he'd been a boxer too, so he'd uh, run for training. And then he realized, I don't really like the getting punched so much, you know, uh, but, the, but the running I like. So, um, so, so, you know, and then, and then he uh, started entering races. Um, uh, but also another, um, as far as being a bricklayer, one of the craziest things that happened to him, he was uh, on the roof of that building, which was, I think, 65 feet up, um, when they were 
pretty much towards the end of, uh, of, um, of building that uh, Coliseum. And um, a gust of wind blew him off the building. And he fell, uh, and he would have been a goner, except that luckily slash tragically, there was a guy walking underneath and landed on him and killed him. Yeah, it saved, yeah. So the guy died, but it saved Bill's life. I know, it's, it's insane, yeah. And it even went to um, the, the poor pedestrian's uh, widow sued the city and the, uh, and the contractor, and it went to the Iowa Supreme Court, so it was, it was a big deal. But, um, uh, but you know, Bill, luckily uh, for him, uh, got out of it, um, so he survived. Uh, he, as he put it, my number wasn't up that day. Um, so some other crazy stuff, uh, as a... As a runner, he was in. Um, he was, as a runner, he was, it was such a niche sport back then. Um, like I said, what people knew about marathons was essentially, you know, back in ancient Greece, Pheidippus ran 26 miles and he died. And and now there, there are these kind of weirdo daredevils, you know, uh, entering marathons. And it, there were very few people in, in the old days, um, you know, in the early days, who ac would actually enter these marathons. Like there'd be between, you know, 15 and 50 guys maybe uh, running, and they were kind of seen as, like I said, daredevils and um, nuts. And um, so uh, Bill, at one point, was working in Arkansas. And after the, uh, they were building a bank, I think, and then they were next door in a saloon. And uh, the guys who Bill worked with were just you know, were marveling at you know, um, this sort of crazy, um, like I said, niche um, side, uh, you know, this avocation. He kind of had this passion for uh, long distance running. And the saloon keeper overheard it and was kind of like, what are you guys talking about? And, so he explained, well, he runs these long road races, and, and the saloon keeper, this is, like I said, in the middle of Arkansas, he says, well, how, um, how, how far do you run? And Bill thought to himself, you know, I could say 26, I could say 25 miles. Because actually, back then, it was, it was only 25 miles before um, they, uh, they standardized the distance at 26.2 miles. Um, but, you know, he, he said, I could tell him 25 miles, but he never believed me, so I'll just say 10. And, and even when he said 10 miles, the guy didn't believe me. He said, you, can, you can't run 10 miles. So I, I said, my horse couldn't run 10 miles. And... Um, Long story short, they uh, they have a Bill races the guy's horse, uh, <laughs> but although it was kind of unfair because the poor horse was actually towing the the saloon keeper, yeah, <laughs> who was apparently heavyset. So, uh, um, and, and sure enough, Bill actually won. Um, so <laughs> he knew it could be done. Uh, and there's and there's real science behind that, um, which is also and dealt with in the in the book. Um, there's a, a guy at Harvard, a paleo uh, a paleoanthropologist, um, whose uh, theory is that um, basically long distance running is what made us human uh, because uh, to, to, to chase after a prey. Uh, so, uh, so we sort of work together to you know, run down big animals and, um, and that's what um, literally uh, gives the protein that kind of grew our brains to the point where we're now you know, homo sapiens. Um, so, so basically, it's, we're, we're kind of built to run long distances, and Bill kind of instinctively knew this, and, uh, and he'd, he'd, he'd read of a, a guy in England doing the same thing, so uh, he knew it could be done and he pulled it off. Um, and then there was also a, a, another thing we discovered was there was a marathon in Chicago that Bill won in 1913 um, when he was so hot. Um, there was a heat wave in Chicago. Five people had died. The day of the marathon, um, the only 12 people, was it, I think 18 signed up and only 12 people actually entered something like that. Or maybe you know, there were like in the teens, but very few people actually ran and three of them dropped out. Um, so the race organizers said to themselves, well, it's so hot, let's just cut the marathon up at 22 miles. Um, what they did back in the day, they would often have... Um, the, the model was kind of um, what they did in ancient, Gre um, sorry, not in ancient Greece, the first modern Olympics in um, 1896. They would have a, a race on the roads, and then they'd come back to a stadium and then finish around the stadium. And they said, well, you know, when the runners come back to the stadium, we'll just cut it off there. It'll be 22 miles. Um, and Bill came in first, and he said, no, I kind of want the whole, I want the credit for running the full distance marathon. So he just kept running around the track until, you know, in the heat, in the blazing heat, until uh, he, you know, finished. <laughs> 26 uh, miles, 385 um, yards. Um, let's see, do I have a, oh, there, there he is in St. Louis. Uh, okay, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I do have a couple excerpts. Uh, th this one is, of, uh, is, is written in Bill's words. So that was the nice thing about having this uh, manuscript, even though it was, it was pretty short. It wasn't like we could just publish the manuscript um, the way it was, uh, but it, there were some great, just kind of gold nuggets, some just great anecdotes. and. Uh, here is uh, one of them. Um, so okay, back in 1915, being out of work in Chicago, again, this is in Bill's words, um, and having been running on the roads all winter with the idea of again trying the Boston race, being out of funds, 
I decided to beat my way by freight, so in other words, hop a freight train, um, hitchhiking not then in vogue. With 30 cents in my pocket, I climbed aboard a cattle car out of South Chicago one night. It was a cold night, so I climbed up and slid into the feed box, closing the lid down on myself. It was warm enough in there as the cattle engender heat, but you can't sleep very well with them eating your bed out from under you. <laughs> I held that train down for two, days, two, uh, two nights and a day, pulling into Buffalo the second morning. The only food I had in that time was at Toledo, where we stopped to take water. Raising the lid of my berth, I saw the picture of a 16-ounce schooner of beer and under it five cents. I was out of that box in a jiffy, <laughs> <laughs> across the tracks and down through those beers, grabbed two handfuls of pretzels, and back into my Pullman. I gave the highball. And they, they would kind of joke about it. They would call their... Um, Cattle cars, the Pullman. Uh, you know, the, the Pullman was a fancy train, uh, train car at the time, but uh, they you know, joke about their uh, Pullmans. Um, I lay over, lay over for a day and slept in a 10 cent flop house at Buffalo, making Albany the afternoon of the fourth day. Before prohibition, it was the custom with most breweries that an out of town visitor could sample the product. So, paying my respects, I was the recipient of four schooners of brew, my vitamins for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving Albany, I arrived by freight in Springfield, Mass. at 2 a.m. I met up with a policeman who, on questioning me, took me over to a livery stable where the night man put me up in the loft to sleep. On being roused at 6 a.m., I learned that I was not the only guest that night. I was allowed to depart with a handshake while my fellow guests, who were members of the local fraternity, um, hobos, uh, were forced to manicure the horses and stalls. Now, within sight of my goal and knowing the Boston section of the 20th century was due shortly, I decked it into Boston, arriving on the fifth day after four days and nights on the road. Yeah. Uh, so he did not win the race that year. Uh, <laughs> That, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he and he was, um, you know, in, in many ways he was, uh, he was a unique character, but but also uh, he, he um, sort of fit the mold of, of the marathon runners at the time. But most of them, uh, you know, again, that's sort of in the title, the, the, the untold story, of the working man's Boston Marathon. And most of his competitors were guys who were doing this uh, on on the side uh, and, and worked by day as um, as printers like Clarence Demar or as plumbers or uh, you know bricklayers, um, that sort of thing. Um, Let's see, and actually, I, w I want to read this real quick because uh, it's something I didn't know too much about um, until researching this. Um, you know, as probably most of you know, uh, women weren't um, allowed to run the Boston Marathon officially until 1972, uh, but that doesn't mean they, ha they hadn't been uh, clamoring for it for, uh, for actually decades um, to, to an extent. Uh, so also in 1915, uh, for the first time, women attempted, this, this is now you know, my words, not, not uh, Bill's, but, uh, for the first time, women attempted to run the Boston Marathon. Uh, Want to know if young ladies will be allowed to run in the marathon race? Read a postcard Brown, um, George V. Brown received of the BAA. Hoppington resident George V. Brown received of the BAA. If not, why not? For women now have the same rights as men. If ladies are permitted to run, please set aside a dressing room for them. We are going to run anyway. The postcard was mailed from Hyde Park in March and signed IHK and MTY. Around the same time, two young women clad in, clad in bloomers, blouses, and leather gymnasium shoes were spotted running down Blue Hill Avenue. After the Globe reported on these unprecedented happenings, six more women sent in entry forms. Properly enough, the BAA officials paid no attention to the entries or requests, the Globe reassured readers after the uh, marathon. With that kind of response, it's no wonder that none of the women showed up on race day. The prohibition on women in the marathon would persist for decades. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, um, and one more quick excerpt, which I think is kind of fun. Um, so two days before Christmas, 1916, Bill exchanged unwanted gifts on the racetrack in Yonkers. Jesse, his wife, had been complaining about all the hardware he was bringing home, the trophies and other prizes taking up shelf space. So he, in addition to marathons, so he won a total of four marathons uh, in his career and um, also many shorter races, or, or even if he came in you know, third, he would get some kind of you know, small trophy. Um, and basically his wife is just getting sick of this, uh, cluttering up the, the you know, the, the house, and she, as, as their nieces and nephews heard the story later, she told Bill, if you bring home another silver cup, I'm going to hit you with it. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, sadly, actually, later on, she, there was an incident where she was throwing trophies down the stairs. Uh, didn't, didn't hit anybody, but, uh, so she would, she would um, you know, she, she, she may have actually meant these words. Um, the day of the Yonkers Marathon was bitterly cold. After running out in the roads, Kyronen entered, um, who's just one of the other runners, uh, entered the Empire City Raceway a mile ahead of Sid Hatch. As the Finn trudged across the, across the finish line, his feet were torn and bleeding and his shoes gashed and cut by jagged ice, reported the Chicago Tribune. His face was numb and blue from the cold. Sid Hatch finished second. When Bill reached the track, he was in fifth place. As he remembered it later, a friend in the crowd yelled out and told me to slow down. 
The fifth place prize, he told me, was a camera, and the sixth prize was a set of silverware. Bill thought about this. I didn't want the camera. You'd have to buy film for it. And Jesse would be, ple would be pleased with the, uh, the silverware, so as opposed to a trophy, she'd like some, you know, forks <laughs> to actually use. Uh, the Tribune uh, related the farce that followed. And now the next bit is from the, uh, the New York Tribune. Kennedy jogged along until half a mile from the tape when he suddenly stopped and threw himself to the ground. To all urging and pleading, he refused to go on and waited for Joseph Carr, who was half a mile behind him, to overtake him. <laughs> it was a long, cold wait out there in the backstretch, and to pass away the time, Kennedy finally got up and began to run, backwards. <laughs> this even was too fast, and he slowed down to a walk, with a stop every minute or two to, to mark Carr's slow advance. Carr was coming on all too slowly, so Kennedy halted again until the Yonkers boy could come up. Carr seemed none too eager to overtake Kennedy, but he was too cold to follow the Chicago man's tactics. Bill was living in Chicago at this time. Uh, and a quarter mile from the finish, passed, um, passed him. Kennedy fell into a dog, truck at, dog trot and plodded along five feet behind Carr while stopping every few minutes to fix a troublesome shoelace. In 40 yards, that lace came untied eight times. And Kennedy <laughs> lost two yards every time he stopped. The handful of spectators was in an uproar over the strange performance. And they say, uh, the Tribune predicted that Bill would face charges before the Metropolitan AAU. As it happened, Bill said decades later, the officials got on me for it, and there was an investigation, but they never got anything on me. Did he get the silverware? Yes, yes, that's yeah. He came in, he came in uh, fifth instead of, uh, or sixth instead of fifth, so he got the silverware, yeah. Um, so I, that's, uh, let's see, do I have uh, any? Oh, okay, I, I did forget to show you this uh, slide from uh, the year that he rode the boxcar uh, to the 1915 Boston Marathon. Um, the whole thing was, uh, another thing, I, um, one of these things that he survived on his way to winning the Boston Marathon in 1917, he, uh, he got typhoid fever in 1913, um, and that seemed like the end of his career, because I mean, that, uh, it was the kind of thing that weakened people so badly, even if they didn't die from the typhoid, they'd catch something else later, and their immune system would be so weakened, they'd, they'd die. Um, uh, so, um, and it prematurely grayed him. Um, he was age 30, and he, he went gray, and he was kind of, it sort of made him, Gave him this uh, prematurely wrinkled appearance. And um, long story short, his uh, athletic club, the Illinois Athletic Club, basically kicked him out. They said, uh, we're not going to pay to send you to, uh, to Boston. So yeah, that was the whole thing. And that's sort of where he gained fame in Boston as the, uh, the, you know, the rail riding runner. Ah, dear old Boston. Um, and there he is finally triumphing in 1917. That kind of goes uh, uh, right back in his job. Yes, yeah, yeah. So here he is. Um, I don't actually know who those other two guys are on the, on the left, but uh, this is again from kind of, you know, one of his scrapbooks. And um, uh, yeah, he served, he, and, and not surprisingly, he was um, uh, an engineer. Uh, he was actually over the draft age, um, but he, he, uh, he kind of fought to get to his way in. Um, he, they wouldn't let him join when he tried to sign up in New York or Missouri. Uh, basically, he, uh, he was living in New York at this point. The uh, wife and kids were back in Missouri. Because like I said, he was always traveling for work. Um, but then he, uh, he, I think he wrote a letter directly to the War Department. They eventually let him in. That's the, uh, so he was in the engineers in um, uh, Company I, and uh, that was their mascot, this dog they picked up along the way. Yeah, <laughs> we couldn't get in the, that in the book. We could only um, fit 10, ten uh, images in the book, but I kind of like that one. Uh, and then while he was uh, in Europe, um, after the armistice, they had this, they called it the Military Olympics, basically all the Allied powers um, had their own uh, Olympics. So like the you know, soldiers, uh, they had, you know, in, intra, you know, um, you know, uh, military uh, Olympics. Then they had the, you know, the Allied Olympics, where they. Would, so um, um, this was one of the races that kind of took part, sort of on the fringes of that. It, it became a big deal. It was this um, relay race that went from um, Chateau Thierry, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, to Paris. Uh, so this is the Place de la Concorde. Um, just here's a huge crowd there. And then that's Bill coming in second in the relay race. And there's a. Pretty good picture of him afterwards. Sid Hatch, and Sid Hatch is interesting. So you know the uh, the, the legend of the, the marathon is Pheidippides, the the military messenger, uh, you know um, back in Athens and uh, ancient um, you know classical times. And uh, but apparently in World War One they, they they still use foot messengers, and, and they even said they were more reliable in some cases than the radios because they, they, um, uh, the carrier they use carrier pigeons and they use radio and they um, they use foot messengers. And uh, so Sid Hatch was, um, he was one of the best uh, marathon runners in the Midwest. Um, and he was a friend of Bill's from when he lived in the Midwest for a long time. 
Um, this is kind of a fun cartoon of, uh, of Bill. Oh, so this cartoon was by this guy, Wank Leonard, uh, who was from Porchester, New York. So basically, after, after the war, Bill came back to Porchester, where, he, where he, he'd mostly grown up. And he, he lived in Porchester for 20, 25 years. Um, and uh, one of his friends was Ed Sullivan, uh, the later um, you know, TV host. Uh, and then uh, this guy, Lank Leonard, who was a cartoonist. So here's a cartoon he did about Bill. And then uh, Lank Leonard was known for Mickey Finn, which, uh, which it was a big syndicated uh, cartoon uh, comic strip uh, back in the 50s. Um, so that's Bill's daughter. Uh, that's that's the um, the trophy that was that Jesse, his wife, threw uh, down the <laughs> stairs, and uh, <laughs> and one of her nieces took it, ran, basically ran home with it, and still has it. Uh, it's kind of funny through through the course of this, I actually, um, my my dad and I came into contact with these um, relatives who you know they're they're actually more like in laws, but uh, um, but you know Bill's um, Bill's nieces and nephews out in. Um, uh, you know, in, in St. Louis, and, and, all, and all, as well as his, um, his daughter's uh, children. We, uh, again, we lost touch because, uh, so my um, great-grandfather, Paul um, Jr., was, uh, was 10 years younger than Bill, and then, so, and then add the fact that Bill moved to St. Louis, so they, they actually pretty much lost touch. Um, uh, so uh, here's some, um, just some cool uh, illustrations that uh, accompany this article I wrote about Bill in uh, something called Narratively, it's a website that has long-form journalism. Um, so I'm going to pause there. Does anybody have any uh, questions? I want to I talk about Hopkinton for a little bit, but yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's his, that's so his daughter. Did he, did he win this one? No, no, uh, that's just a, a picture of him. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So he won the, the St. Louis Marathon in 1913, the Chicago Marathon in the same year. Uh, and then the Boston Marathon in 1917. Uh, not to give anything away, but um, I, I still think I, I still think it's pretty dramatic and fun to read. You know, if you watch Titanic, you know what's going to happen. But you know, it can still be a good movie. Um, but uh, and then and then in 1924, he ran, he won a, a race in, a marathon in Long Island, uh, New York. Um, and that the, the funny thing about that actually, do I have the the receipt? Maybe I didn't. So sorry to be skipping through. I, I may have accidentally not uh, included this. So he won this marathon in, on Long Island. It was another hot day. He actually liked running in hot weather, weirdly enough. Um, but he, he won that marathon. And they told him, the organizers uh, um, said that the, the first prize is a, um, like a, I think they said it was a six foot bronze statue of Mercury. And, uh, and, and they, it, oh, it's great. It's great. This, you know, it's a bronze statue. And uh, you're going to love it. Um, we'll send it to you. And here's a the, here's the receipt, even. Here's a receipt from the. Uh, jeweler that made this or, or you know or coated it in bronze or whatever it was and he said never saw the receipt but he, he wrote this in the in the 60s when he's in his 80s he says, I, st I still have the receipt you know <laughs> um, but they never sent him that uh, supposed statue um, and now yeah that was the last uh, marathon he won in 1924 when he was uh, 40 40 years old um, any other questions Yeah, well, you, you probably know better than me. Well, so what I understand uh, in, the, in the early days, there was kind of a mix. There were, I mean, I mean, the very first marathons, the guys apparently weren't even really wearing special shoes. I mean, there was, there was no marathon running per se. So in the 1890s, it was like, you know, I think the gym shoes maybe and bicycle. Well, bicycling was a thing. So people would wear bicycle shoes, um, basketball shoes, and they were just kind of flimsy. You know. They, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, leather or maybe canvas. Um, and then there was, and then in the 20s, there was this guy, uh, I, I can't remember his name. It, it's in the book. It, they called him Star Streamliners. Does that ring a bell? There was some, there was, yeah, there was a shoemaker that, um, I mean, and I'm talking like custom made. It was you know, Clarence DeMar and these guys would go to this one cobbler, basically, and, and he would make them special marathon shoes. Uh, so it wasn't even something you could go into a you know, running store to, to buy. Um, but it, and those were, I think that was in the 20s. Now it's the first time they had kind of ventilation and they were lightweight and they were, and they were white because because early days that people were wearing black leather shoes and they'd be, you know, there's no ventilation and um, yeah. Yeah, and I think I mean I think in 1917 there, there were let there were sneakers with rubber invented, but they just didn't. They hadn't caught on until much, much, you know, decades later. 
Sure. Um, let's see. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I was saying there's two George Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George Brown at the BAA received. I mean, everybody here knows who George B. Brown was. For, uh, yeah, yeah. So he received the postcard. Yeah, the postcard was, was written to him, addressed to him. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was signed uh, IHK and MPY, which is kind of, in, you know, I didn't, and I, I really didn't think of I mean, it. I suppose we could have really delved into that and tried to find out, well, who were IHK and MTY? And it's interesting that they gave their initials, like, where, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so sorry, but. your work, did you ever, did, it, did you, can you find, find any reference to women finishing? No, they never, not even, not even running, not even unofficially running. This is, that, that was pretty much the extent of it, was that they, there was some kind of, um, oh, you mean the Boston Marathon or Bo marathons in general? Oh yeah, didn't didn't come across anymore in Boston. I did come across uh, uh, as far as um, just kind of informally practice running. You know, so in 1908 uh, there was the big, the, the kind of the first almost forgotten marathon boom after Johnny Hayes, American Johnny Hayes, won the um, the Olympic marathon in London in 1908, and that was another big deal. There was just all kinds of drama around that. Um, and uh, does anyone know that story? So basically, the the, the, the guy was. Uh, came in, was, was um, running in first for most of the time. Uh, now, was it Durando? I'm blanking on the name, I can look, but I believe it was Durando. And um, kind of leading up to this, there'd been all sorts of bickering between the American and, um, t team, uh, uh, you know, their teams, I should say, you know, across the sports, across several, several of the sports, and the, the British Olympic Committee. Um, like, the, the, in the opening ceremony, they didn't have, a, you know, initially, they didn't fly the American flag, uh, so, so the Americans were complaining about that. And, and then when the, um, when the Americans marched by, um, the, the uh, American standard bearer kind of dipped the flag in, in, when they walked by the king's um, uh, viewing area. So there's all kinds of, uh, just, you know, it was just, you know, almost like an international incident, really, you know, just diplomatic, diplomatic kerfuffles. Uh, and then, um, so the guy who was running in first in the marathon, and again, you know, they ran on the roads and came back to the stadium. And uh, so this guy entered the stadium first, but he was a mess. And I think, again, with the doping, I, they, they actually would, uh, they would ingest strychnine, which is rat, you know, rat poison, like, like, because apparently they thought that in tiny, I mean, it didn't kill him, this did happen, uh, but they, they, they thought that would kind of perk him up, but it, you know, it, it, they, people get sick on it, it was horrible, yeah. So this guy, Durando, um, had been given the strychnine, uh, and, he comes, and he comes into the, into the stadium and starts running the wrong way, you know, and then, and then he collapses, and then basically, you know, long story short, the, um, a couple of the British officials, you can kind of understand it, they, they're, they're thinking, well, he, you know, he made it all the way here, and, you know, cheerio and all that, like this, you know, this noble, you know, uh, um, guy, he's, you know, he's really, put, you know, put in the effort, and so they, they, they carry him across the, the finish line, and they think, well, he finished, you know, and then, so the, um, the, the American uh, uh, Olympic um, officials are jumping up and down, but that doesn't count. You know, it's, it's coming in first, and, and, and while they're you know arguing, basically, the um, an American Johnny Hayes uh, came in second, but they, and then and it was like hours before they sorted out. You know, they, they were kind of arguing, and eventually the British uh, officials grudgingly awarded the um, you know the first place to uh, to Johnny Hayes, and you know, and their and their position was like all oh, these Americans are kind of whining about it, but uh, but it, you know, in the states, it was you know. Johnny Hayes was the winner, so uh, that kind of uh, sparked a little marathon uh, boom, uh, at least in New York and Boston and kind of in the, in, in the Northeast. And Bill would travel around, and like I said, he'd be in places like Arkansas, and people still hadn't even heard of marathon running. Uh, but at least in the Northeast and urban areas, it was, uh, it was a big deal. And so to get back to the point, at that time, there were reports of, um, of women running around um, a, uh, like Central Park. I could, if, if you want me to find it, I probably could. Uh, that was in Boston, uh, but, but just, just on, yeah, yeah, they, so they were practice running, they were just kind of training out on Blue Hill Ave, um, yeah, in Mattapan, uh, in Hyde Park, and, uh, but yeah, there, there, were, there, were, there was, there were reports in 1908, 1909, I guess 1909, kind of following the, uh, the running, the, the, that first running boom of, uh, of women, again, I think they were, you know, they talked about them wearing bloomers and gymnasium shoes, um, just kind of, you know, and they, they said they would run for a mile, and, and um, 
it, it, it's real condescending the way that uh, the journalists of the time kind of described it. But um, but you know there was definitely some interest in it back then. You know, yeah. Um, you know, so it's interesting. So I have, uh, I came across a great article, which I, I can read to you in large part, because I, I think you guys would be interested in it, uh, uh, about Hopkinton, but there wasn't an equivalent um, kind of feature on, on Ashland. Uh, but, you know, I mean, Ashland was the, I mean, it's referenced time and time and again for the first 20 years, um, uh, almost, uh, uh, of, of the marathon, because that was the, um, Stevens Corner was, was the starting line. Um, so, but they don't really delve, they don't give, go into details the way they did in Hopkinton later, unfortunately. But, yeah. Any other, all of a sudden, uh, the air stops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to mention a couple of weeks ago, the uh, Hopkinton Public Library had the documentary Boston from the community coming out. Yeah. And that was the first time I heard about Frick Layer Bill, because they mentioned him in the film and show some pictures. And yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I haven't really talked about that much, um, but that's like the longest chapter of the book. Actually, is uh, um, the 1917 marathon, and then um, and uh, it's just kind of interesting. Uh, there were um, uh, you kind of forget about this now, but uh, apparently, um, with all the shipbuilding in Boston, uh, uh, so so Germany basically uh, was disrupting the shipping uh, to, to Europe. You know, not surprisingly. Um, and, uh, and there were sightings of submarines um, in, in the North Atlantic, you know, it, you know like off of Boston, off of New York. And, and then uh, like a year later, there, wa there was actually a sea battle off of Cape Cod and, and uh, um, some um, torpedoes landed on a beach in, in, on Cape Cod, uh, which I, I had no idea of that until I did this research. Um, so there, there, was a, there was reason for people to be kind of frightened back then. And, um, uh, you know, in Boston, it being, like I said, a shipbuilding town, kind of a, um, a shipping port, it was, um, you know the closest port to Europe, uh, the close, closest American port to Europe. Um, so it was it was a big deal. People were, uh, you know, pretty frightened. Uh, and um, so it was, I, you know, the, the way I, I read it, it was kind of, um, yeah, you know, it was, in fact, they almost called off the marathon that, that year, uh, um, you know, because of these concerns. Um, it's kind of like you kind of hear about, you know, today should we hold this this big event? Uh, but they they did. They 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 went forth with it. And, uh, um, sort of harkening back to um, you know some of the sports writers were saying, oh, we can't call it off because uh, the whole you know inspiration for the marathon was Philippides, a military messenger, you know, um, it, and it was Philippides slash kind of Paul Revere too, right? Because uh, it was a Patriots Day thing, um, but uh, so they, they, they you know they, they held it, and, and uh, the runners who were favored to run to, to win were um, uh, a couple of uh, Finnish runners. The, the, the Finns were, were really the, uh, the top runners of the day. And it was basically a question of which one of the two Finns is going to win. Uh, and so nobody really expected an American to win. Um, so that's kind of why it was such a big deal that Bill won. Uh, and he was wearing um, a bandana. Again, I mentioned he, was, um, you know, he, he went gray prematurely. Uh, and so um, he actually wore a bandana kind of to cover up the gray hair. Uh, and that year, um, a friend of uh, his friend's wife uh, sewed an American flag onto the bandana, and so he wore that. And back then, you know, an American flag bandana wasn't really a thing. People had kind of never seen this before. Um, uh, so that, that, that kind of image just really inspired people and uh, sort of made it, uh, the, I think, kind of made the memory of his winning, winning the marathon that year pretty enduring. Um, oh, and uh, then the following year, 1918, they, they didn't exactly cancel the marathon, but they, they held the marathon, but it was a relay race. So if you really want to be, uh, I mean, it's hard for me to say this, but I'm sure someone from outside Boston who has no kind of skin in the game would say, well, then the marathon wasn't run that year because it was a relay race, you know, but because um, um, nobody actually ran 26 miles, 385 yards. I don't want to think of that way. I think they held it as a kind of a wacky relay race. Um, and that's why it's, you know, uh, a race was still held over the distance. And that's why, um, you know, it's still the longest continuously uh, run marathon in America. Yeah. Would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah. Any other? Uh, do you want me to read the, um, the the bit about Hawkington? And I'm sorry that, I, like I said, I didn't find anything um, similar, anything equivalent for Ashland um, to this uh, feature. Um, but uh, so this is from the Boston Globe, April 17th, 1932. Oh, let me skip ahead to the um, the photos from that. And actually, I can. Uh, I guess on the way there, I can stop and um, point out anything else of interest. So Clarence DeMar, as you can see, won it seven times. Um, actually, the fun thing about this was uh, 
Clarence Demar, you know, very interesting character. He uh, he won the marathon in 1911, uh, and then uh, I, ca I kind of think of it like, did you ever see the movie or read the book The Natural? You know, he it's, it's, he kind of just took this mysterious hiatus from marathon running. Um, but it turned out to be actually not so mysterious because he did run some shorter races ev uh, eventually. But he basically uh, he was done with marathon running, uh, and then but then he came back to it in 1917, uh, and at that point he was 29. Uh, Bill um, Bill Kennedy was uh, was was 33. He was reported to be 35. People thought he was 40, like I said, because he, he had the gray hair and he was all kind of wrinkled for his age and um, because of the typhoid fever, and uh, so. Um, Clarence even told the press, wow, you know, seeing, uh, and Sid Hatch was about the same age as Bill, he, Sid Hatch came in second, and Clarence DeMar told the press, uh, well, geez, if these two old guys can, two, two old fellows can, uh, can manage, you know, but maybe, there's a, maybe a young fellow like me can, uh, can keep at it. And, and so sure enough, he, you know, he kept, kept running it, and uh, he basically ruled the 1920s. Um, and like I said, most of the marathon runners in, the, in that era uh, you know, were, were part-timers, and it was, running was their passion, but, but by day they were printers or, or, you know, or, or cops or um, bricklayers, carpenters. Um, that's just a kind of, Oh, here's another interesting thing. So everyone, I think everyone in this room knows that um, the starting line, the starting line of the marathon used to be in Ashland, and then they moved it west um, because, like I mentioned earlier, um, the, uh, after the 1908 Olympics, which was 26.2 miles, uh, eventually, by 1924, um, which uh, was when the Boston Marathon was an Olympic qualifying marathon, which, th which they couldn't do today because uh, um, now an Olympic qualifying event has to be, right, it has to be a, a, a loop. Um, it, Boston Marathon is point to point. But in 1924, they, they still um, would allow that because uh, it was kind of the, the premier marathon uh, in the States. And uh, so, um, so they extended, they extended the starting line and pushed it to, to Hopkinton. But does anybody know how the um, how the uh, the finish line has changed over the years? So it used to, and this this always confused me because if you're familiar with the, with the finish line, you see on the left that's the Hotel Lenox. So it looks like the finish line today, right? That's the Hotel Lenox on the left. But actually, I should actually I should create a map for this to make it clear. Um, when they got to Kenmore Square, they kept going down Com Ave, and then took a right on Exeter Street. So they're actually around the corner from. Um, so the 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 um, the Boston Athlet Athletic Association is on the right. They, they, um, that was the, the, the clubhouse, and then uh, that is the Lenox Hotel on the, on the left, but it's around the corner from where the finish line is now. Um, so it's a little bit confusing, but uh, it took me a while to figure that out. But uh, yeah, so they, they kept running down Common Ave and then took a right on Exeter Street, and the finish line was on Exeter Street. So they only crossed Boylston you know, for a second and then, and then finished on Exeter Street. Um, and, yeah, and the whole story of the BAA, I, I think, is uh, pr pretty fascinating. When you know, it was founded in 18. Was it 88? I, I believe, and uh, it was kind of this um, this gentleman's club. You know, they had they had a gym, they had but they had a billiard room, and they uh, they also had um, you know in, in the days before there were there really was a uh, kind of wasn't quite the same professional sports universe as, as today. There was of course there was you know uh, professional there was major league baseball, and you know the Red Sox were big, the Braves. But other than that, um, like who do you think the uh, the, the biggest um, the most popular hockey team was in in Boston in, in Say the 19 teens, it was the BAA hockey team. Yeah, yeah, they had a hockey team who traveled to Montreal, traveled to, to New York. I, yeah, I never knew about any of that until uh, researching this. Um, yeah, they had a, they had a, a, a you know, rowing uh, crew, um, but then they basically um, they went bankrupt in the 30s and almost closed. Um, were it not for you know the Browns, for, for George B. Brown and uh, Walter Brown, um, and Walter Brown kept it going. Uh, so um, you know that's so, so we we have a kind of Hopkinton people to to, to thank for. Keeping it going, which is a nice, I guess, segue to um, to this. I'll try to. Uh, I, I actually have a few questions for you folks about some of these. Uh, so again, this is from 1932 in the Boston Globe. Uh, the headline is "There's much more to Hawkington than starting point for marathon." By Victor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> go, go figure. This stuff happens here 364 days a year too, right? Um, and that's sort of his point. He said, "Every April on Patriots Day, thousands of people lining the route of the classic BAA marathon." Uh, know that the weary road racers started the grind back in a place called Hopkinton. Hundreds of other people all over the world read in the newspapers that so-and-so, usually Clarence, Clarence H. DeMar, won a 26-mile race which started in Hopkinton and ended in Boston. But only a very small proportion of the, all those people have ever been out to Hopkinton. Even those who go there to witness the start of the BAA run do not see the town itself, for the common and most of the houses lie a mile or so up 
The steep hill beyond the starting line opposite the, opposite the yellow buildings of the Lucky Rock Manor. Right, well, let me skip to the... Uh, I'm just writing him. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, so there's... Uh, yeah. And you can see, you know, back, back in... You know, this is when the, the marathon was growing to the point where maybe there were, a, you know, a couple hundred uh, guys running it, uh, as opposed to the early days when it would be like 50 or less. Yeah, and apparently um, the, uh, a lot of the runners, uh, once they moved, to, moved the starting line to Hopkinton, a lot of the runners stayed at uh, Tebow's farm. Is anyone familiar with that? Someone actually came to, so uh, my dad and I did, a, uh, did an event back in November, and someone from Hopkinton came, who now uh, lives at the site of Tebow's farm. But it was basically a farmhouse, and it was kind of informal. They just, it was like pre-Airbnb, but it was just sort of, you know, <laughs> just opening up, you know, uh, they, hey, we have a bunch of rooms. Uh, any runners want to stay here? And um, so it's just kind of funny, uh, they would be, you know, these guys who are competitors, but they're also friends. And I, I think that's one of the um, themes of the book because that really came across, you know, these guys were rivals, but yet they were, they were buddies. I mean, they, they sort of understood each other uh, because running, like I said, was a niche sport that people thought they were, you know, weirdos for uh, running such long distances. Um, and so they kind of uh, had a camaraderie. Um, okay, let me skip it ahead to, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yesterday we had a speaker, um, a Narragansett, a member of the Narragansett tribe, and he started this talk by telling us that he hoped you would mention Harry. Oh Day. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's featured in the book as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I, I I worked briefly at uh, Harvard um, a couple of years ago, and uh, at the time um, when. Uh, the, one of the museums at Harvard was, was putting on this event about Native American running, so I kind of delved into that uh, for that article. It was pretty fascinating. Um, when you were talking about shoes and stuff earlier in that uh, documentary, Watson, they said early runners ran barefoot, some of them. Oh, yeah. And they'd run through the mud so they wouldn't be painted. And um, the early shoes they showed some really, really shoes. It looked like Slim did little cotton shoes and it fall apart. Yeah, yeah. I believe he did. I think the shoes fell off. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, he, and, he, and um, this book, actually, this is kind of cool. Uh, so when I worked at BU, um, I met, well, actually, I didn't even meet him, but I used to talk to him uh, by phone and email, but uh, Johnny Kelly, um, and he actually sent me a copy of this book that he had helped uh, Jock Semple write. Um, and uh, and I, I remember in my, I think, like my sixth grade, uh, library, the Washington Irving in Rosendale, I believe they had uh, this book, because I, I, as soon as he sent it to me, I, I said, oh, I, I recognize this. Um, you know, I, I read this uh, in sixth grade, it was at the library. Little did I realize until looking carefully, that was my great grand uncle Bill on the left there, on the cover, yeah. <laughs> so I think maybe he's got a stopwatch and Jock Simple's pretending to, uh, to, to, you know, he's at the starting line. Um, and here's, of course, the infamous, the infamous, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, oops, all right. So let me get to the uh, the Hopkinton stuff. Uh, I just sort of tacked on to the end. Um, the Hopkinton limb of the law. So Pat Dempsey represents 50% of the Hopkinton PD, the other half uh, working nights. Um, so so the, you know, these are the, uh, I, I'll try to, there's four photos, I'll try to remember to, to uh, sh show them to you as I'm going along. Um, so in that article from 1932, um, well, what about this town of Hopkinton? What is it like? How did it get that way? If you go out to Hopkinton on any but a marathon day, it is not so very different from a lot of other towns in the vicinity. One of the largest towns and area in Massachusetts. Hopkinton was founded way back in 1715 when the land was purchased from the Natick Indians. Uh, since then, it has had a career not wholly undistinguished, though you don't hear much about it except once a year. And then they kind of went into the, um, the, the history of it, which I'm sure a lot of you folks know is named for Edward, Edward Hopkins. Daniel Shays was, was uh, born and raised here. Um, Hopkinton sent 115 minute men to conquer, conquer in Lexington. Um, in its earlier days, uh, before the coming of the railroads, Hopkinton was an important stop in the stagecoach journey from Boston to Hartford. That route, part of the shortest journey, shortest journey even now from Boston to New York, is to be, re is to be revived shortly with a new automobile highway. Uh, again, this is 19, uh, the 1930s, they're talking about this. Um, to that time, the time of the stagecoach, dates Stone Manor, the old town tavern just off the common. Is that, is that correct? Is that, yes. Okay, all right. Because there's, 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 there's also a stone 
in, in Ashland? Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, that confused me. Okay. All right, Stone, what, was it the same family or? or? Okay, okay. But I mean, it was, were they, were, um, A guy named. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, learn something new every day. Uh, George Washington, of course, stopped there, and Lafayette did even more. He once slept there. The house still stands. It's massive granite, defying all age. And so it's still there, right? That's that's great. Yeah, that's still true. Uh, it, was that? Oh, no kidding. Oh, wow. <laughs> did anyone see in the Globe today? There was uh, some house uh, for sale um, for 2.9 million. Uh, oh, wait, what was that? It was like this. Uh, Gingerbread uh, kind of house. Uh, it was, uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, my wife and I were talking about that. Oh, just scrape together 2.9 million. We can, uh, we'll make it back by turning it into a B&B. Um, but anyways, okay, Brigham Young. If you, um, you know, Brigham Young was from Hopkinton. If you pay a visit to Hopkinton, uh, okay, if you pay a visit to Hopkinton, almost everyone will tell you that Young was born in Hopkinton, whereas he was actually born in Vermont. Is that, is that true? Does anyone know that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, is that right? <laughs> Uh. <laughs> oh, is that right? Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to start that brawl that I was worried about. <laughs> uh, leading uh, manufacturing center. Uh, some 40 or 50 years ago, Hopkinton had the largest shoe factory in the whole United States, uh, known as Davenport Block. Is that still there, Davenport Block? No. We have a new, we have a new condo development down the road that's named Davenport. It's okay. In honor of that. Huh. Yeah, it's interesting how these names kind of uh, crop up. Like, like in, in New York, uh, another thing I discovered researching this was uh, there used to be, um, there was something called the Irish American Athletic Club. And they were, again, pre most professional sports, they were huge. Uh, um, so they, were, they, they had track and field athletes, like Johnny Hayes was a member of the Irish American Athletic Club. And they had, uh, this is kind of funny, they, were, they, were, they had trading cards, but they were in tobacco. So it was like, you know, it's just kind of funny, tobacco and their athletes. But, uh, um, but anyways, uh, in, in their, their old um, field is called Celtic, uh, Celtic Park, and uh, now there's, again, there's a, a housing, there's an apartment complex there called Celtic Park. Um, let's see. Okay, John Sheffield, a Hopkinton citizen, is generally credited, credited with the invention of the wooden pegs, which once were universally used in putting shoes together. Um, this is kind of interesting. Uh, uh, the, in these early days of large-scale in those early days of large-scale production, before machinery had really replaced hand labor. Hopkinton was way ahead of Brockton and Lynn in shoe production. Actually, I don't, I don't know who they're quoting. They put a quote there, but uh, um, was way ahead of Brockton and Lynn in shoe production. Indeed, the inhabitants of Hopkinton will tell you today that the shoe business in these and other New England cities was started by the sons of Hopkinton, factory owners who started on, the way, started on their own away from home. Uh, there, apparently, there was a carriage works, a gun works. Um, this I didn't know, the stone in the Custom House Tower um, was, uh, was, was quarried here in Hopkinton, as well as the stone for another big building. Anyone have a guess or, or already know it? Penn, Penn Station, someone say Penn Station? Yeah, Penn Station, yeah. Um, back to farming now. For, for one reason or another, Hopkinton failed to keep pace with the advance of the Industrial Revolution, and during the last few decades has returned almost entirely to farming. Uh, there is only one small mill left in the town, a thread concern, and the population, sinking during recent years to something less than 3,000 souls, is engaged almost entirely in agricultural pursuits. Um, th and this next part uh, is like a little bit borderline uh, on PC, but Hopkinton, is, Hopkinton has thereby escaped the influx of foreign-born residents and is today virtually 100% Old New England, uh, <laughs> with most of the families tracing their, citiz their citizenship in Hopkinton back several, century, uh, several generations. Uh, there are, for example, the Phippses. There are more Phippses in town than anyone else. Any, any Phippses here? Is that true? But, there, but it's pretty common, yeah. yeah. Um, one of them is the owner of one of Hopkinton's general stores and presiding genius over the forum, which invariably takes place around his stove during the winter. Um, I'll skip back to that for a second. Uh, that's the general store. Yeah. Yeah, if you can read, it says, uh, yeah, discussion, yeah, general store and discussion forum. Yeah. Are there any, uh, is there any of his descendants still around, Dan Mahoney? Is he on the membership rolls here, I wonder, you know, like, like back in the day? We didn't start the society until 1961. Oh, okay. But clearly there was interest in it, but I don't think he's old New England. Yeah. Right, it's funny, I, I was going to say that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he gets a pass somehow. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, I got that impression actually, because uh, they also mentioned the um, uh, Pat Dempsey, who constitutes in person half the Hopkinton uh, Police Department and has been helping school kids across Main Street for as long as anyone can remember, sharing the suppression of crime with the Night Force, composed of John Whalen. And it says, you can converse, converse with Dave Crockett in the drugstore. Uh, and then the reporter put, uh, at least I hope you can. I couldn't, for there was a sign on the door back in an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, jeez, I can't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's there's a picture, right? Yeah, that was that was on uh, George George V. Brown's um, uh, prime. Yeah. And actually, so, so, so I, I researched this book for years and never thought until this morning. Does what is what does the V stand for in George V. Brown? Does anybody know? I, I, this isn't like a trivia question. I, I actually just thought of it this morning. Uh, I have no idea. But uh, it's because I've, I've written, you know, in typing up things, you know, I've written the guy's name a million times and it suddenly occurred to me, I don't know what it is. So that is the, um, the I think that's the, 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 the house that was built in 1790. That was the oldest building still standing at the time. Um, yeah, because that, that caption got cut off. Uh, And it, said, it says that, uh, that's where the, um, yeah, that's right, it was a firehouse. It said that, that they kept the, the hand tubs there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess it's the tower that's growing. Yeah, there's a little bit more about that. I, unfortunately, I uh, neglected to print that page, so I'm going to have to, no, but I, I, ha I have it right here. Uh, oops. Yeah, the oldest building now in George V. Brown's farm. Um, I think it said, let's see, hand. Oops. Yeah, it, uh, on Maplewood Farm sits the old Hopkinton Firehouse, built in 1790, used to house the hand tubs, including the one which claimed the world's record 50 years ago. Uh, but the Hopkinton, this is again in the 1930s, but the Hopkinton Fire Department still depends upon volunteers to man its modern equipment. Um, I don't know if that's still true. Is it still a volunteer? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll, th this is, uh, and then this kind of all comes together with uh, George V. Brown. Um, oh, actually, wait, real quick, another uh, inter interesting tidbit. In 1931, the Hopkinton High School football te team only had 12 kids on the team, like total, not, not you know, so they were special teams, they were, <laughs> they were offense, they were defense, and one of them broke his collarbone in the first week, so they played the rest of the season with just the 11 and still won all seven games. So yeah, I don't know who they were playing, like what kind of <laughs> their competition was like, but um, it didn't say. Oh yeah, I just said Hopkins and High. Yeah. Um, so the man who will fire the pistol, which will start the 200 odd runners off in their jaunt from Hopkinton to Ex Exeter Street um, in Boston is George V. Brown. Most, so this is kind of interesting, most Bostonians think that J Brown is a dyed in the wool city fella, and people look upon him as Boston's prime Puck pecan or hockey nut. Um, the truth of the matter is that Brown is probably more interested, interested in his fine and valuable herd of Guernseys than he is in anything else. In his office at the arena, um, and here's a qu quick uh, trivia question. Um, they're talking about the, uh, the Boston Arena. Does anybody know what that is now? It's yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So the BAA hockey team, that's where they played, was, was the arena. Um, couldn't find any pictures of, of, uh, of those games, there was, but there was plenty of coverage of it. Uh, I mean, it was like your front page. Um, but uh, let's see, if you, if you give uh, Brown a chance, half a chance, he'll start talking about his bull and, um, and we'll produce pictures of the animal. Uh, thereafter, George ceases to become a city fellow and becomes the owner of one of Hopkinton's show places, the Maplewood Farm, one of the state's model dairies. Um, <laughs> tell me if you've heard this uh, urban legend before. There have been some people who have suggested that the only reason that the Patriots Day Marathon started in Hopkinton and ended at the BAA clubhouse was because Brown once was chased by one of his bulls to his favorite club in town. Is <laughs> 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 that kind of a joke you guys have heard before? Yeah. Uh, there is, of course, nothing in this. Uh, for the BAA, BAA race used to start at Ashland, and Brown's bulls can't chase anyone because they have rings through their noses and are led around on steel pokers, or whatever you call them, 
by Chief Herdsman Axel Carlson, uh, or perhaps by Tom Brown, star of the Hopkinton Highs uh, football team. Um, but there's no denying that even the Brown Dairy is not utterly divorced from Brown's athletic interest. Uh, one of his most promising young, young bulls is named Lord Burgley, after the crack English hurdler. Uh, and one of the biggest rooms in the barn has been fixed up into a sort of private trophy room, its walls crowded with athletic pictures and sporting souvenirs. Um, supposedly, the, uh, his herd had the, uh, their, milk fat had the or their milk had the highest content of uh, butter fat in New England. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they mentioned the, the hand tubs. Now, honestly, until I started researching this, this book, I had no idea about uh, hand tub musters. Have, has anyone been to one of those? So there was uh, something in the, um, the Brockton, uh, there was coverage of the Brockton Fair Marathon. You know the Brockton Fair? They used to have a marathon uh, before, the war, before World War I. And, um, and it said some of the other events where there was a, a hot, air, hair, hot air balloon ascent and there was a hand tub muster. And I had, I had to Google it. I had no idea what, uh, you know. And, and funny thing, I think I'd even been inside um, this kind of random, if anyone knows uh, the, the Jerry Five in, in Marblehead. I'd been in that hall and didn't know what the, you know, what, what the, it was, it was the VFA, the uh, Veteran um, uh, Firefighters Association. I didn't even know uh, what the connection was uh, until I, like I said, Googled hand tub musters to try to figure out this, uh, Thing happening at the Brockton Fair, and it was the, the, the you know water pumping contest between the antique um, uh, you know f fire engines uh, basically, um, which and it's, it's supposedly <laughs> the, the nation's uh, oldest uh, organized sport, um, and they held the they held the uh, the record 50 years prior to 1932. Um, all in all, Hopkinton is quite a town. So, yeah. uh, so that's uh, pretty much it. Does anybody have any other questions? Oh yeah. That was part we used in competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, uh, you can see a picture of it. It's pretty cool. I guess it kind of kept it alive on the North Shore, but not yeah. so much here. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, I guess it takes a lot of work to re to maintain and restore and all that. Yeah. yeah. So this is the house. Oh, okay. Oh, actually, my favorite—I forgot to mention my um, favorite part uh, of uh, my favorite this kind of little detail uh, about uh, George V. Brown's um, herd. The the prize bowl was named Rockingham Peerless. I just love that Rockingham Peerless. <laughs> so that's it for the Hawks so and stuff, yeah. All these photos were from that, from that same, article. yeah, yeah. I, did, uh, I have to thank my wife for, uh, she's not here, but I'll thank her in absentia for cropping them uh, this morning, actually, yeah. Because it would have been too much all on one page, but, yeah. Thank you so much. Sure thing, yeah. <laughs>